Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on uh, synaptic mechanisms. In this video, we're going to look at uh, Huntington's disease, and we're also going to look at uh, how the complexins are thought to be very involved in Huntington's disease. Okay, and I want to stress that this is an area of ongoing research, and that what I am telling you in this video is uh, our current position on Huntington's disease. And it may well transpire that our current position is wrong, basically. So this video is going to be on Huntington's disease and complexins, and how we believe that complexins are very much so involved in the uh, disease phenotype of Huntington's disease. Right, so this is a, um, a video that's following up my discussion of the complexin proteins and their role in the release of neurotransmitter. So let's just remind ourselves of how the complexin proteins were involved in the release of neurotransmitter. So remember, uh, we drew all of this in the previous video. So um, you have these synaptic vesicles docked at the plasma membrane via these core snare complexes consisting of synaptobrevin 2 in orange here, SNAP25 in turquoise, and syntaxin 1 in blue. Okay, now, these core snare complexes consist of these four alpha helices contributed by the uh, free snare proteins, one from uh, both synaptobrevin 2 and syntaxin 1, and two from SNAP25. These alpha helices bind together uh, electrostatically in the zero ionic layer, and they also wrap around each other to, um, to form a very strong core snare complex. Okay, and a mystery basically was why do these core snare complexes not bring the membranes close enough together, the uh, vesicle membrane here and the plasma membrane here? Why do they not bring them close enough together that it actually causes fusion? Well, we believe the role of the complexin protein is to bind to these um, snare complexes, and we know it binds to the snare complexes, and then sort of clamp them, stop them from completely um, twisting up and bringing the two membranes close enough that they actually fuse. So we think that complexin is uh, for, is functioning as this clamp protein and stopping uh, the fusion of these um, vesicles with the membrane prior uh, to um, prior to an action potential arriving. Okay, we then saw that there are two complexin proteins, complexin 1 and complexin 2, and that their distribution within the brain is basically complementary to one another. So where complexin 1 is, complexin 2 isn't, and where complexin 2 is, complexin 1 isn't. So uh, every cell in the brain will have one or the other, basically, either complexin 1 or complexin 2. Right, so when an action potential comes, uh, calcium then comes in through the N or PQ type voltage gated calcium channels, and this calcium binds to synaptotagmin 1, uh, 1 or synaptotagmin 2, which is also in the membrane of uh, the synaptic vesicle. Now, synaptotagmin 1 and 2, uh, 1 or 2, uh, does a lot once the calcium has actually bound in order to promote the fusion of the docked synaptic vesicle with the plasma membrane. So, for instance, one thing that it does is bind to the complexin protein and it changes the function of the complexin protein from having a clamp function to having a profusion, um, uh, profusion um, function, basically. So, to promote fusion. So the complexin protein's function changes, and this is really important. We're going to come back to this a lot in this video. Okay, the complexin protein initially functions as a clamp protein, but later on it is really important in actually driving the snare proteins to uh, fuse the two membranes together. And if you knock it out, if you knock out both complexin 1 and complexin 2, it causes a huge loss of neurotransmission, approximately 60 to 70 percent of neurotransmission or release of neurotransmitter is gone basically by knocking out both of them. If you only knock out one, the phenotype's less severe. Okay, uh, we'll discuss this more in the moment. Okay, and um, 
So that interaction of synaptotagmin with, synaptotagmin with complexin is thought to be very important in driving uh, the release of neurotransmitter. In addition, we know that synaptotagmin interacts with syntaxin 1 and also with the lipids to produce this invagination of the membrane inwards that's going to bring uh, this plasma membrane closer to the um, phospholipid bilayer of the vesicle. Okay, so now let's discuss uh, the role of all that, what this all has to do with Huntington's disease. But before we can do that, we need to discuss complexin knockouts. So basically, you can make knockout mice. So we're going to make knockout mice, basically. So we're going to uh, take our mouse uh, zygote, okay, so this uh, mouse egg cell fused with a mouse sperm cell, and we're going to genetically alter it. So we're going to do and make knockout mice. And uh, basically, we're going to initially knock out complexin 1 and see what happens, basically. Okay, so if you knock out complexin 1, you get a mouse that has a that is impaired, basically. This mouse has quite a severe phenotype. It has ataxia, okay, which means lack of coordination. So basically, if you have a complexin 1 knockout mice in a cage, so let's say we have our cage here, okay, so we've got our mice kept in this little cage here, then basically if you keep this um, complexin 1 knockout mice with the normal mice, so-called wild-type mice, so uh, for some reason in genetic experiments, people don't refer to normal mice as normal mice. Instead, they call them wild-type mice, or they will abbreviate that often to WT mice, okay? And they'll often abbreviate knockout mice to K.O mice, okay? Right, that's just if you're ever reading research papers, you'll always see these expressions. Right, okay, so basically if you have these knockout mice with these wild-type mice, the wild-type mice will be skitting around, you know, they'll run around really frantically uh, in their cage, all overexcited. Whereas these complex in one knockout mice, they'll be sort of plodding along, thumping over. So basically, they'll be moving really clumsily, they'll, you know, the, their movements will be really clumsy and uncoordinated, basically. They won't be running around beautifully like the normal mice. They'll be clumsily sort of knocking, uh, you know, walking around, missing steps and falling over, you know. That's what is meant by ataxia. In addition, they get seizures, they get epilepsy. Uh, so they get areas of the brain which can become completely overexcited and start firing in synchrony that then causes motor seizures basically where uh, the muscles will start to um, oscillate out of control basically. Uh, so these complex in one knockout mice get quite severe symptoms because of the disturbance to neurotransmission. So um, that's what leads to um, Yes, yeah, so complexin 1 is clearly very important in, uh, con in functioning of the brain. Okay, so now let's discuss complexin 2 knockouts, because these are the ones which are interesting to people studying Huntington's disease. Okay, so if you make a mouse with a complexin 2 knockout, it, get, it looks absolutely fine. The mouse will be running around with the wild-type mice just fine. It's a much less severe phenotype than complexin 1. Okay, but, but, there are, it does have defects, but they're much more subtle. You have to do quite advanced psychological experiments to actually, um, actually find anything that's wrong with this complex in two knockout mouse. So, we're going to discuss a, um, a very sort of famous uh, gen um, psychological experiment that can be done. Okay, and it's called uh, the two-choice swim tank, and basically it's very, very similar to the Morris water maze. The Morris, Morris water maze and this are almost identical. So this is called the two-choice swim tank. This is slightly, um, slightly simpler than the Morris water maze, but effectively they're the same. Two-choice swim tank. Okay, so let me explain what the two-choice swim tank is, because this is an experiment in psychology. Okay, so what you get 
is you get a tank of water, basically. But you don't just have normal transparent water in this tank. Instead, you have opaque water. So you have some opaque fluid. So maybe you might use milk, okay? So you can't see through this fluid. So this fluid is opaque. And I'll note that by putting these black lines here. So the fluid is opaque. Now, uh, in the tank, what you will put is a platform, basically, at one end of the tank. So this is a platform. Okay. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take your mouse here. So here's your mouse. Okay. And you're going to do something rather cruel. You're going to stick it in this water tank. Okay, so here's our mouse. And we're going to put him in the water tank here. And what he's going to do is he's going to swim around frantically trying to get out of the tank. And eventually what he will find, eventually he will find this platform and he will stay on the platform because he can stand on the platform quite happily. Uh, so this, uh, the platform's at a level so that, uh, yes, it will, won't be visible. You won't be able to see it through the liquid. But if he's standing on there, basically... Let's have him here. I know this drawings have gone a little bit wrong, but here you go. If here's the mouse, um, he can stand on there and be quite happy. Yes, his feet are in the milk, uh, but he's not uh, at risk of drowning on the platform. So he wants to find the platform. Okay, now, that's a bit of a boring experiment so far, just swimming around randomly. So we're going to introduce something else. What we're going to do is we're going to put a light over here where the platform is. So here's this light where the platform is. And then we're going to take away all other external stimuli. So we're going to do this in a dark room, but for the fact that there is this light here. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to get your mouse, put it into this tank, and he'll swim around initially. The first time you put him into the tank, he'll swim around, frantically trying to find something that he can stand on. He'll find the platform eventually, and he'll stand on it. Then what you do is you take him out of the tank again, and you put him back into the tank. So maybe a little bit of time later, maybe half an hour later. And you put him back into the tank. And he'll do the same thing again. And gradually what will happen if you repeat this experiment over and over again, he will learn to swim towards the light to find the platform. That's what a normal mouse will do. That's what a wild type mouse will do. Okay? It will eventually learn that it needs to swim towards the light to find the platform. If you continue training it on this exercise, this two choice swim tank, and the reason it's called a two choice swim tank is that you can either swim away from the light or you can swim towards the light. That's the two choices of it. Okay? So he will eventually learn that the platform is where the light is and he will swim towards the light. Now, if you get your Complexin 2 Knockout Mouse and you get your Wild Type Mouse, okay, so if you take your Wild Type Mouse and analyze how quickly this mouse learns to swim towards the light, and then you take your Complexin 2 Mouse, uh, Complexin 2 Knockout, so Complexin 2 Knockout, well, basically, you're expecting me now to say that the Complexin 2 Knockout is less good at this task. Well, actually, they are just as good as each other. They learn just as fast as the normal wild-type mouse. So learning is not impaired. Learning is not impaired. Well, apparently it's not impaired. But what we're going to do is another experiment, and we're going to see that, in fact, it is impaired, but in a much more subtle way than this direct learning. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to play a trick on the mouse, okay? We're going to take our wild-type mouse and we're going to take our complex into knockout mouses and we're going to train them, basically, to swim towards the light to find the platform. What we're now going to do is take another two-choice swim tank over here where this time the platform is at the opposite side to the light. So the light is now on the side where there is no platform. So again, here's the opaque fluid so that the mouse can't see where the platform is. And now our light is at the opposite side. So what we do is we take our wild type and our complex into knockout mice, which have been trained on this original apparatus up here. So they think that they need to now swim towards the light to find the platform. So we put them both into this tank. Uh, well, we don't put them at the same time. Uh, but we put them one by one into this tank. 
And what happens is initially both the wild type and the complex in two knock out. They're going to swim towards the light because they think the platform is over by the light. However, if you continue this experiment, what will happen is the wild type mouse will eventually, uh, well, what will happen is when they're put into this tank, they'll go over there, they'll find no platform, crisis, they'll have to continue swimming around and eventually they'll find the platform. Eventually what will happen is the wild type mouse, if you keep doing this, the wild type mouse will learn to swim in the opposite direction now. The wild type mouse will learn that the setup has changed, the rules have changed, it now needs to swim away from the light to find the platform. So the wild type mouse is capable of relearning. It's capable of destroying its original uh, training and modifying it. So the wild type mouse is capable of relearning. The complex in two mouse is the complex in two knockout mouse is really bad at this. The complex in two knockout mouse will still be swimming towards that light uh, after loads and loads of exercises of doing this and showing and you know and and realizing that obviously the um, platform is no longer over by the light so basically the complex into knockout mice will not relearn nearly as quickly as the wild type mouse so they don't relearn they can't well they they struggle with relearning struggle to relearn so it's quite a um, quite a subtle cognitive deficit that this uh, complex in two uh, knockout has that it once it's learned something once it's learned to swim towards the light it's really struggling to, to realize that the rules have changed and that it now needs to swim away from the light to find the platform uh, the wild type mouse will learn that much quicker than the uh, complex in two knockout okay so it's a it's a advanced cognitive cognitive deficit. Now, in humans, this sort of a cognitive deficit would be called perseverance. Perseverance, okay? And it's one of those cognitive deficits that is not understood very well. However, it is a deficit that is seen in people with Huntington's disease. And in fact, when you look at these complexing uh, knockout mice, they actually have very, very, very similar phenotypes to mice which have Huntington's disease. And we'll talk about that in the next video.